But I want you to understand that I'm here to lecture and maybe not so much to preach. Now, if you knew me as a preacher, you would know that there are times I'm, I'm a triple S preacher, that spit, stomp, and squall. <laughs> but this is a series of lectures, and I assure you I will be a little more distinguished in uh, lecturing than I am sometimes in preaching. But uh, I've been asked to do a series of lectures on great spiritual awakenings in the country in which we live. For you see, our country, the history of it is a story punctuated by great spiritual awakenings, periods of unusual revival. Now, most historians would say there are probably five such periods. Some would want to subtract one and others might want to add one, but we're going to stick with the figure five. These periods of awakening have done tremendous good in, in our nation. Not merely for the church, but for the church. Immense church growth has come out of spiritual awakenings. You see, the church as a rule does not grow greatly if it simply marches step by step in cadence. History tells us that the church grows more in leaps or what I'm going to call broad jumps. And those periods of broad jumps are periods of great spiritual awakening. Now, they are good for the church. They are also good for the nation as a whole. And I've done a great deal of study on this subject. I'm convinced that almost every social reform of any proportion in our country can be traced to one of these great awakenings. Now, please understand what I'm saying here when I use the word war. There is a sense in which spiritual awakenings are like wars. You see, this nation has fought some great wars. World War I, the Civil War, World War II, great wars. Well, we fought a war in 1847 with Mexico. Some of you didn't even know that. We fought a war in 1899 with Spain. These are lesser wars. So there are greater wars and there are lesser wars. And that is true as well relative to spiritual awakenings. There are greater awakenings, and there are lesser awakenings. The first great awakening, and I'm going along with most church historians at this point, the first awakening for this nation as a whole began in the 18th century when this nation was not yet a nation. It was 13 colonies stretched along the Atlantic host, uh, coast. The most recent of these awakenings probably would be one that took place in the middle of the 1950s. Uh, some people would want to add one on, but regardless of how many you want only an extremely prejudiced student of history would fail to see that tremendous good has come out of these awakenings, not merely to the church, but to the nation as 
a whole. And I've already indicated to you that great moral and spiritual reform has come to this country out of these awakenings which the church has experienced in time gone by. I illustrate this with a statement from Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon was talking about a decade, the 19, I'm sorry, the 1860s to 1870. Spurgeon said this. He said, during the decade that ends in 1870, such wondrous changes have been wrought throughout the world that no prophet would have believed them had he foretold them. Reforms have been accomplished in England and in the United States, in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, which according to ordinary reckoning would have taken a hundred years. But because of the awakening that was experienced, those great advances took merely a decade. Now, as to uh, how long the period of an awakening lasts, it could be anywhere from two years. MacDowell and Reed in their splendid book, Firefall, suggest even as many as 50 years. And uh, we're prone, if we study this aspect of church history in our country, we're prone to begin uh, with the Wesleyan awakening, at least if we're considering the English-speaking world. And as a rule, some would like to put the Wesleyan awakening before the first great awakening in the 13 colonies. But the truth is that awakening occurred in the 13 colonies 12 years before John Wesley was ever converted. And the Wesleyan revival came some 20 years after the first great awakening. A second mistake we're prone to make is that when we look at awakenings in this country and we consider the first of them, we're prone to begin it in New England. But it didn't begin in New England. It began in those colonies which we usually refer to as the middle colonies. That would be New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. Revival began in these middle colonies. Now, I think before I talk in terms of that awakening specifically, it would be good if I just explain to you a little bit about the general effects of migration. You know your history well enough to know that the period of time about which I'm talking is a period of migration. First, it was migration from basically England, but other European countries as well, migration from there to this country. In time, it would be migration across the Appalachians into what would be referred to as the frontier. But when people migrate, as a rule, those people represent a social strata that is lower than the norm. I mean, if you're comfortable at home, most people don't want to migrate to a place where they're going to have to build their own log cabin and wonder if the Indians are going to let them live through it. So socially and culturally, a lower, strater, a lower strata of people, as a rule, are migrants. And usually, when they come to the country to which they're 
migrating. They are prone to stumble even more. Many who came to this country were motivated economically. And this is not true of the pilgrims, by the way, 1620 at Plymouth. But many who followed them had an economic motive in coming to the colonies. They didn't come seeking God. They came seeking gold. And immediately, on arriving into this country, almost to a person, they slumped in religion. Uh, It was essential, however, that a migrant adopt something of uh, a spirit of rugged individualism. Now, I think that became beneficial because it, uh, I think, resulted in the kind of salvation which people experienced in this country becoming more personal rather than institutional as it has been from the country from which many of these people came. It's always surprising to us to learn that uh, even off the Mayflower, out of the 101 people who, uh, who constituted the, the colony at Plymouth, only 12 of them were members of the church in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, established shortly after that. One in five were members of the church. And uh, though there was some fire periodically in the way of spiritual awakening in the 1600s, actually, it was a picture of a church which was cold. Worship was cold. They did it Sunday morning. They did it Sunday afternoon. They did it midweek. There were no uh, no instruments. They simply chanted uh, the psalms. Sermons lasted two or three hours. Don't get worried. I'm not going (laughs) to emulate one of them. Most of them were extremely hyper-Calvinistic in doctrine. And in almost every colony, there was a state supported church. In New England, it was the Congregational Church. In Virginia and other southern churches, it was the Church of England. But the clergy that had come to this nation, as a rule, was of an extremely inferior variety. For instance, Dr. Thomas Bray arrived in Maryland as the commissary of the Church of England. He found so much immorality among the clergy that it was necessary to discipline them. And things were in such a bad state that when he called two of the most flagrant offenders, quote, against morals and decency, to account, the members of the church were offended Don't treat our preacher like that. What's wrong? What have they been doing? And uh, Bray was shocked when he found the low state of morals among the clergy, and uh, it resulted in his writing a memorial upon the state of religion in America. And uh, in this writing, he appealed uh, for learned, strong, capable clergymen to come to this country. He made the statement, the refuse of the clergy of England will not do for American missionaries. And the same thing was true in Virginia. Governor Berkeley said uh, there are 48 parishes And the ministers are well paid. 
He says, I think they probably would do better if they preached less and prayed more. Hey, quite a bit of insight there. But he said, as of all other commodities, the worst is sentence. And the rector of a Virginia parish wrote the Bishop of London that several ministers had called such scandal lately that the people were hesitant even to receive a clergyman or a preacher in, in many, many parishes. In uh, the late 17th century, around 1680, there was a serious decline in Puritanism in this country. At one time, it had been extremely strong. But morally, even among the Puritans, conditions were terribly, terribly low. It was nothing to sleep together with somebody who was not a husband or a wife and was looked on as a harmless custom. Drunkenness was rampant in the colonies. Any unusual occasion was an excuse for drinking. For instance, in Jonathan Edwards' own hometown, when a new meeting house was being built, 60 men worked a week, consumed during that week 69 gallons of rum, besides several barrels of intoxicating cider and several barrels of beer. Maybe that's the way they got paid. But it is no wonder that a great clergyman, Increase Mather, wrote a classic regarding the state of religion in this country. It is called The Glory Departing from New England. And he was writing around 1700. And he was comparing conditions in the church with what they were some 50 years ago. And as far as he was concerned, the glory, the glory had departed. He says, oh, tremble, for the glory is going. It is gradually departing. We are losing the fire that our fathers have given to us. And this is where this country was in the late 16 and early 1700s. By the way, have you ever wondered why that in the Christian faith in this country, we have been traditionally evangelical, evangelistic, and experiential now, this was not true of the nations which gave us our first citizens. In England, there was the Church of England. Religion was sacramental, liturgical, and formal. The same would be true of Holland and Germany. Religion, basically formal and ritualistic. In my opinion, the answer as to why a different kind of faith emerged in the 13 colonies, in fact, I, I believe it beyond the shadow of any doubt, it was the first great awakening in this country that shaped the faith and determined that this country in its faith would be basically evangelical, evangelistic, and experientially, and experiential. And it, it began, by the way, in what we call the middle colonies. Now, generally, we take the 13 colonies and we talk in terms of New England, we talk in terms of the colonies in the South, and we talk in terms of the mid-colonies, as perhaps I've said, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. 
there were, particularly in Pennsylvania, some German groups that were beginning to experience some revival fires. They were Moravians. Some of them were Seventh-day Baptists. One was a man named Conrad Beisel, who became a tremendous evangelist among Seventh-day Baptist, tireless in his evangelistic efforts. He quickly became the foremost evangelist in the 13 colonies. But almost simultaneous with what was happening in Pennsylvania, a young Dutch Reformed pastor migrated to this country. His name was Theodore Frelinghuysen. Now, Frelinghuysen had no intention of coming to this country initially. He was with a a group, and uh, we would say uh, the executive director, the administrator of the Dutch Reformed Church was in that group, and he was talking about four churches that desperately needed a pastor. And uh, Freelinghuysen thought those churches were located in Holland. He volunteered. (laughs) Then to his amazement, those churches were located in the 13 colonies. But he was a gutsy kind of man, and he was not about to back out. And so in 1720, Freelinghuysen sailed to the 13 colonies and landed in New York City. There's some people you can read pretty quickly, and they read him pretty quickly. It's obvious that we've got a troublemaker on our hands. Uh, For instance, he was invited to preach in the first church of New York City. Now here's a young, hot-hearted, maybe not so discreet, uh, sometimes a little tactless preacher invited to preach in the sophisticated pulpit of us church. The men at headquarters complained about his howling prayers. And he preached a rather strange doctrine a new birth kind of experience that resulted in holy living. On top of that, when he was invited to lunch at the home of the man that we would call the executive director, he saw a full-length mirror on a a closet, and he thought, boy, how carnal to have a mirror like that. And he spoke his peace. About it. So I say they knew they had a problem on their hands. He disdained formality. He thought it was fleshly at times. He came with this motto, and he put this on the back of his sled. I would rather die a thousand deaths than fail to preach the truth. I seek not praise, I fear not blame. And he began his ministry in those small churches in the Raritan River Valley in the state of New Jersey. Now, the people to whom he was going to preach were a bit rough and boorish. They really weren't interested in spirituality. They were interested more in maintaining their Dutch identity and also holding on to their language, the language of their native land. Really, we would say that it's a poor match from the human standpoint, but from the divine standpoint, it was a match made in heaven. Now, Mr. President, 
if I understand, we have 11 o'clock classes. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go past 11. But I, I, really? Yes. Sick him. <laughs> These people really were not interested in spirituality. By the way, I spent an afternoon driving around that part of New Jersey. All four of those churches are still in existence and are prospering unusually. But he became their first pastor. He began to preach. Not only that, he believed in church discipline. And he was preaching to what we would call a bunch of carnal Christians. There would be times they were coming to the supper of the Lord. They do that in some churches, you know. We pass the elements out in beautiful uh, plates. But in many churches, people come to the altar to receive what they call the sacrament, what we call the elements of the Lord's Supper. Well, they came toward the front to receive the elements. And Freelinghausen would say, look, look, even the unregenerate and the unrepentant are coming to take the supper of the Lord and to drink judgment to themselves. And many of them would turn around (laughs) and decided they didn't want to commune after all. Well, we shouldn't be surprised that ultimately uh, the moneyed people wrote a letter to the, uh, to the headquarters in Amsterdam itself, the Klagte, made up of complaints against Freelinghausen. But by then, he was well ensconced. And uh, the young people... Doesn't it begin with them frequently? The young people began to respond to his ministry. The youth were converted and took a liking to what he was saying. He called them to a higher life. He challenged them. The young people really began to preach to their parents. But... Here is a beginning of awakening in the colonies. By uh, 1725, all of his deacons and elders were converted. (laughs) You know, that that just sort of sounds like revival to me, but uh, the dry bones began to come to life. He began small group prayer meetings, and the congregation increased in numbers. Conversions were seen regularly. He became something of an itinerating evangelist. New churches were begun, and in 1726, the Raritan River Valley, by the way, the Raritan runs out of the mountains of northern New Jersey or the hills of northern New Jersey, down not too far from Norfolk, through the Sea of Rutgers on into the Atlantic. But that's the Raritan River about which I'm talking. And by 1726, the churches along the Raritan were in revival. Ultimately, this awakening which was experienced by those of Dutch reform communions. Ultimately, it spread to Presbyterian churches, which were also in the rare tan. Freelinghuisen became a close friend with a relatively young Presbyterian preacher 
whose name was Gilbert Tennant. That's a name you'll need to remember. And probably you could spell that one. He had moved to New, Broad, uh, to New Brunswick, New Jersey. Now, there really was a sharp contrast between, between religion in those sections of the country about which I spoke a minute ago. In New England, religion was of a rather monolithic structure. But this was not true in the mid-colonies. There was great diversity there. Few churches except congregational churches could be found in New England. But in the mid-colonies, you will find churches of virtually every denomination. By the early 1730s, a large number of Presbyterians had come from Northern Ireland to this country. They had been persecuted there. They settled in eastern Pennsylvania. Now, if you know anything about Pennsylvania, you know that Philadelphia is to the far east, bordering the Delaware River. So essentially, it is right on the border. And uh, when I say eastern Pennsylvania, I'm talking about a part of Pennsylvania that's very near Philadelphia today. A minute ago, I used the word boorish. It's probably an unfamiliar word to you. I used it to say they were not interested in spirituality. And this was also true of many of the Presbyterians that had come to this country. I'll give you some idea how far they had strayed from evangelical commitment. When Jonathan Dixon a deeply committed preacher, and certain others of his stripe began to ask that prospective pastors share a conversion experience. It was an insult, and they were voted down. Now, I think we have every right to ask a prospective pastor to share his conversion experience. It says this. It says, first of all, if it's voted down, the majority probably are in a fairly moribund state spiritually. But it does say that there were some who still doctrinally and experientially were standing strong for the Lord. Out of this group came the young man whose name I mentioned to you a minute ago, Gilbert Tennant. It really would be wrong for me to introduce Gilbert Tennant to you without also introducing his father, William Tennant. That's a name you ought to know. Now, William Tennant had come out of the Anglican Church. He had a genuine conversion experience. He became a Presbyterian. He was not a great preacher, but he was a great schoolman. And what he did was he began a college in his own home very near Philadelphia. You'll find it on the east side of Philadelphia today, in fact, Neshemini. He wasn't known for his preaching, but he had four sons, and he wanted them well educated. So he began teaching Greek. He himself, a graduate of the University of Edinburgh, Greek, Latin homiletics, and uh, soon other young men wanted to join his four sons in benefiting from that, that uh, instruction they were receiving from 
this godly man. But there are a combination of factors here that resulted ultimately in revival fires beginning to burn in the mid colonies with Freelingheisen and with the tenants. God uh, had the ingredients, those human elements with hot hearts and the desire to see individuals changed and ultimately a new complexion regarding their country. And God began to use them. Now, Theodore Freelinghuisen, whom I mentioned to you, saw revival in his church. But Gilbert Tennant was experiencing a rather ineffective ministry. Tennant wanted what he saw in Freelinghuisen in the way of results. He became deathly ill. And he prayed in that illness, Oh God, make me well. God, give me six more months of ministry. I promise you, I will win souls. I promise you, I will be a minister of effectiveness. God gave him six months, many more months. And he followed through with his promise. And God began to use him powerfully as a preacher. He had brothers. And they caught the fire. And soon what had begun in the middle colonies became a conflagration. And God used this log college, if you please, to change the complexion of the middle colonies during this period of time. George Whitfield, a name you probably know, the great evangelist, the greatest preacher. There's a star of the show, it's Whitfield. But Whitfield loved coming to the 13 colonies. I can't refer to them as the United States because we weren't that yet. But they were the 13 colonies. He loved coming. He made seven trips that he crossed the ocean 13 times. Doubt other than the sailors on the ships themselves if there were other individuals who crossed the Atlantic as much as George Whitfield. But Whitfield loved coming, preaching in the new country. And he felt right at home with the men in the log college. There were already two universities in this country, Harvard and Yale. And he made a comment that all we can say about most of our universities is that they are glorious without, but from this log college, Seven or eight worthy minister of the go- ministers of the gospel have recently been sent out, and others are ready in the wings. William Warren Sweet, who wrote textbooks when I studied church history here, Sweet says that uh, when it came to making an impact on this country. The impact was not made by 
the older colleges, Harvard and Yale. He says the impact was made by Log College. That was a tremendous contribution on the part of William Tennant, a place like Southwestern has been, a place where we not only attempt to cram facts into the heads of students, but would like to put fire in their hearts as well. And that's what was happening in this log college. And in time, revival, revival will produce division. And it did. It did in New England, there in the Congregational Church, after awakening had come, we had the new lights and the old lights. The new lights, pro-revival in the Congregational Church. The old lights against it. Presbyterians, we had the new sides and the old sides. And inevitably, Spiritual awakening will create division in the church. What happened at Log College completely changed the course of American Presbyterianism. It turned it, if you please, in the right direction. And William Warren Sweet says, if a teacher is to be judged by his students. William Tennant Sr. must be ranked among the greatest of American teachers. And he turned out men, brilliant men, but men who had warm hearts for reaching the world in which they lived for the Savior whom they represented. Now, I indicated to you a minute ago that uh, men who were entering the ministry did not have to give a profession of a conversion experience. <clears throat> Gilbert Tennant thought that they should, and he preached what probably is the second most famous sermon preached in the 13 colonies, maybe in the history of our country. He preached a sermon on the danger of an unconverted ministry. Now, friend, the fat hit the, flan, uh, the fan when he preached that sermon. He referred to certain preachers as Sadducees and Pharisees, and even went so far as to urge people to leave those churches. Now, he realized that he was a little bit discreet. That is, when he, when he had gained 10 years of age, and uh, he wrote what he called his Irenicum. That's an appeal for peace. And if he had offended, then he certainly did want to make amends. Gilbert Tennant became pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Philadelphia, and he's still one of the great names in Presbyterian history in our country. But things were happening in New England as well in the 1720s. The Congregational Minister, Jonathan Edwards, probably the keenest intellect in the 13 colonies. And some people would say that 
America has never surpassed with anybody the keen mind or the supreme intellect of Jonathan Edwards. But Edwards took a church which his grandfather, of which his grandfather had been pastor. By the way, his grandfather had been an evangelistic preacher. In fact, he claimed that his church had had five seasons of awakening, five great periods of revival. His name was Solomon Stoddard. Solomon Stoddard was a man with a hot heart. He believed in winning people to Jesus Christ. Jonathan Edwards was his grandson. And uh, the blood of his, of his grandfather coursed in the veins of Jonathan Edwards. And Edwards began to preach with keen intellectual power great spiritual force. He began to preach in that church in Northampton, which he had inherited from his grandfather. And he made the statement that soon uh, the dry bones began to come together and uh, the movement among them waxed louder and louder. Soon, somewhere between two and three hundred people had been converted in that church in Northampton. By the way, Northampton itself had only about eleven or twelve hundred. So that means they almost ran out of prospects. And Edwards became something of an itinerant for a while. He preached in churches along the Connecticut River on which the city of Northfield was located. And some 30 other churches experienced awakening, most of them along the Connecticut River Valley. But Jonathan Edwards himself became something of an itinerant. It was in the city of Enfield, Connecticut. You check your atlas. Enfield is just across the border in Connecticut from Massachusetts. It was there he preached what unquestionably is the most famous sermon ever preached in the United States. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Two to three hundred people were seized by the Spirit of God. They began, some of them all, to fall out, if you please. Others came to the altar and said, Dr. Edwards, is there no mercy with God? We don't know how many people were converted that night. But we do know that serious impressions were made in the lives of the two to three hundred who gave evidence that God had been dealing with them. Sinners in the hands of of an angry God. And Edwards literally held on to them and and said it's like the hand of God. God holds on to you and you are right over the pit of hell. And when he chooses, 
he can unclasp his hand and you will be lost. That's the kind of preaching that Jonathan Edwards was doing in Enfield. He preached that sermon before in his own church and saw no results. But when he preached it in Enfield, then the Spirit of God powerfully moved. And this became another factor in the first great awakening. Now, I think I said to you early on that there were three distinct geographic entities, if you please, three sections of the 13 colonies. New England, mid-colonies, and the South. I, uh, I don't think I'll try to get into the South right now. It'll be my privilege to uh, lecture again at three. And uh, those lectures will be in the Williamsburg room, I believe, of the Student Center. But there, I'm going to talk about the invasion of hot-hearted men into the southern part of our country. And probably we'll take time to get into the uh, second great awakening.